time that the cat specific baits have been used in the southwest. They're little sausage type shaped baits. So it has some secret ingredients that present, you know, like an oily exterior. So it actually looks like a sausage that you might want to cook and eat. You know, it's attractive. Well, if you're a cat anyway, a feral cat. And the active ingredient is 1080, which is a poison that occurs naturally in around 40 species of plants in the Gastrolobium genus. So it's a toxin that the native fauna have evolved with and so they have developed a resistance. So it's very effective in controlling um, introduced predators and doesn't impact on the native species. <coughs> the fox and, and the feral cat have done exceptionally well in these environments and we've actually got photos of them out here with bandicoots in their mouth. The early signs are that we are impacting the feral cat population and certainly that we're impacting the fox population as well because they will take the cat baits. One species that has suffered from feral animal predation, almost to the point of extinction, is the elusive western ground parrot. We're also monitoring two of the little subpopulations that are the stronghold of the western ground parrot, which is critically endangered. Basically, you know, this is it for that population now. There's a small number of birds left in the Fitzgerald River National Park, but the bulk of the animals are here. Originally found throughout near coastal Western Australia, from north of Perth to east of Esperance, the population has now alarmingly been reduced to two small pockets on the south coast. You know, the next step from critically endangered is extinction. Um, there's not many left. Our last estimate of population was that there was less than 110 individuals left in the wild. Rarely seen, the western ground parrot is a challenge to monitor. Well, I was working with them for five years before I saw one. <laughs> I guess because we work out there, we tend to see them from time to time, but they're not commonly seen. You have to be very lucky. And their colouring is very cryptic and helps them blend in really nicely to the vegetation. They forage on the ground. They spend the day um, moving around in this low heath, which is you know, very rich in seeds and flowers. They do fly, and they're quite capable of strong flight, but it's uncommon to see them fly. Being so secretive, the best way to survey numbers of western ground parrots is to listen for their distinctive calls as the birds move from their daytime feeding ground to their nighttime roost. Well, uh, the peak calling time is usually about 40 minutes uh, before sunrise and 40 minutes after sunset, so that's when we usually head out listening. We sort of listen for an hour either, either side in the mornings and the evenings. Okay, that's one calling now. It basically rises in pitch with every call. Something like um, a kettle boiling. The numbers are so low that without careful management, the western ground parrot is likely to become extinct in the next decade. We can't continue to let things go without trying to conserve them. If we lose the ground parrot tomorrow, what's next? And, you know, it's our responsibility to look after that for our generation and future generations. Other threats to biodiversity include the spread of exotic weeds such as bridal creeper and freesias, which compete for space with native plants. And although some native plant species have adapted to regenerate after fire, most animals are unable to survive the damage to their habitat. One species, particularly vulnerable to the effects of fire on its habitat, is Gilbert's potteroo. Originally discovered in 1840 by naturalist and explorer John Gilbert, they were seldom seen again and were declared extinct for around 130 years, until 1994 when they were rediscovered in the Two Peoples Bay area east of Albany. A deep haul recovery program has brought these critically endangered marsupials back from the brink. From only 40 animals, they've increased the population and established another colony near Mount Many Peaks. 
Led by principal research scientist Tony Friend, the program is achieving amazing results. Well, the Ponderoos were always found in a fairly small area of the south coast from an area between Albany and Margaret River. For some reason the Potteroos declined in their range and um, we can only speculate about how that happened. I think the best explanation probably involves separate populations being caused by fragmentation, so clearing between um, isolated colonies and then one by one the colonies died out until we ended up with only one left at Two People's Bay. After its rediscovery, a breeding colony was established in captivity. A few young were born in the first couple of years, but then breeding stopped for no known reason. So a different approach was taken and some animals were released onto nearby Bald Island, where they successfully bred up in the predator-free environment. By 2011 we had 60 animals on the island, so it was really important to take advantage of this rapidly growing population to provide animals to move to other areas. An area near Mount Many Peaks was suitable for potteroos and a fence was, was built around uh, 380 hectares. Since then we've moved 36 animals into this enclosure and the population here is now starting to grow. We've had lots of breeding, we've recorded 17 or 18 young that are born in the enclosure and we're seeing this population starting to grow successfully as well. We figure there's about 130 of them at the moment. That makes it one of the rarest mammals in the world. In fact, the rarest marsupial that there is in the world anywhere. Uh, we census the Potteroos three times a year. Now with the new enclosure as well as Two People's Bay, it takes us six weeks each time we do it. We gather information on the numbers. Each animal is marked so we, we can tell how many we catch. So 68B58F9, okay, that's female 162. Uh, we weigh them and we check their condition and check them for parasites and um, make general observations. Particularly the females, we have a look at them pouch and, and see how they're breeding. We measure the size of the young, count the number of young that are being produced. Teeth in the mouth. Yeah, she's got her teeth in the mouth. She's not letting go. This is a little female. She's about a month and a half old and she'll get about, oh, probably four times as big before she comes out. Gilbert's Potteroo have a specialised diet of fungi and truffles, which they dig up from underground, therefore playing a crucial role in nutrient cycling and the health of soil. I'm pretty optimistic about the future of Gilbert's Potteroo. Um, I think we've been lucky that the species breeds well in the wild. Okay. Off you go. We've got a great team of people working together on the species. I think um, the community, definitely the community in Albany, wants to hang on to Potteroo. Now that's really important. Uh, the fact that we've got a community group that's been formed specifically to save the Potteroo means that they want to hang on to those really rare things. As a society, we have a responsibility to look after the biodiversity that we've inherited. Australia has a, a mass of fantastic animals and people come from all over the world to see them. So we're we going to let them go extinct? I don't think so. There are reasons to put a lot of effort into conserving our really rare species. Most life depends on fresh water. 
and the health of waterways along the south coast is influenced by activities directly upstream from them. Several rivers and estuaries in the region are in pristine condition. However, many waterways are showing signs of degradation, in particular the loss of fringing vegetation due to clearing to the water's edge or damage by grazing stock, resulting in high levels of erosion and sedimentation. High sediment loads from cleared areas can transport large amounts of nutrients downstream, causing algal blooms. This affects fish communities, bird life and ultimately biodiversity. Environmental consultants Steve and Geraldine Janicki, along with other individuals, community groups and state government agencies, are helping build the knowledge base of South Coast waterways to manage and protect these lifebloods. The wetlands and waterways have been of great importance to Indigenous people for thousands of years, not only as a resource to survive, but in social and cultural terms, spiritual terms. And in our Western culture, in many ways, we've lost touch with these systems. The network of waterways is, is the main thing that connects the landscape together from an environmental point of view. And uh, for all creatures and plants and animals and people, of course, draw on the waterways as a resource, sometimes directly, if they want the water, or sometimes indirectly in the terms of recreation or simply being able to live in the landscape and enjoy living there. The drainage network is uh, essential to our overall health and mental health. There's quite a number of rivers on the south coast, probably about 15 to 20 major systems and many smaller ones in between. Two broad aquatic bioregions have been identified for river systems in the region. The west and south coast, from Gardner River to Bluff River, and the east and south coast, from the Palinup River through to Thomas River. The river systems were formed a uh, long time ago, of course, but what is characteristic is when Antarctica and Australia parted company, the south coast border, as it were, slumped, and the streams and rivers that may have flowed more northerly and inland then started to flow south. So we have very short rivers on the south coast flowing from perhaps 100 kilometres inland, uh, fairly directly down to the, to the ocean. On the whole, the river systems of the south coast are in reasonable condition. There are degrading influences taking place, but because it's been cleared relatively recently, a lot of those processes are in their early phases. Catchment clearing and altered land use resulting in changed hydrology and increased salinity levels are major threats to rivers in the region and can be associated with increased erosion sediment transportation and altered turbidity and nutrient levels. We're trying to understand how to balance use of the resources which we need with preserving the, the parts of the system that need to operate in a natural way. But an interesting thing has happened over the last 100 years that People have been moving off the land, there's fewer people in the country towns, farms are getting larger and people are concentrating more in the cities. As a result, lots of landowners are struggling to be able to make their businesses work and do good environmental management at the same time. But most farmers want to do the right thing by the land and they are struggling to be able to fit that into a busy day. Determining the health of waterways is quite complex. There's a number of factors involved. We would look at the actual structure of the channel, uh, the water quality, of course, which includes its salinity, uh, acidity, amount of oxygen in the water, uh, temperature. Temperature is quite a significant factor. The other quality of the river that we look at is the what's called the riparian zone, which is the uh, fringing vegetation and the floodway, looking at the composition of the vegetation, the health of those plants, are they looking healthy, are they dying, are they being replaced by weeds. 
One of the changes that that has been observed in a waterway as a result of negative impacts has been a shift in the nature of the species living in the, in the pools along the river. Generally in a pristine environment we might expect many different species but in, in low numbers for each species whereas in a degraded system we can expect to see fewer species but in very large numbers. The greatest threat to our waterways outside of the changes to the landscape is the indifference of the population. One thing we can do as a community to help ensure the future health of our waterways is to value them ourselves and impart those values to our children. And I think it means getting out of the classroom, letting young people experience the natural environment and uh, discover and explore in those areas. So very much an educational component that applies to adults as much as it does to children. And children will pick up the values of their parents. Conserving and restoring river systems will help improve water quality and ecosystem health, reducing environmental problems in estuaries and coastal wetlands. Many of the South Coast waterways are known globally for their ecological values. Lake Gore and Lake Warden in Esperance are Ramsar wetlands, an international treaty that focuses on the conservation and wise use of wetlands and their resources. They were listed for their unique system of interconnected lakes and provision of a major refuge for resident and migratory shorebirds. However, in previous years, the Lake Warden catchment has been inundated by heavy rainfall, which has resulted in the death of vegetation along the shoreline and reduced the beach area available for shorebirds to nest and to feed. A collaborative effort between Esperance Regional Forum, landowners, DPOR and other project partners has implemented revegetation works in the catchment in combination with engineering solutions to lower the water levels to depth ranges suitable for the recovery of shorebirds and increase the beaches, this is allowing fringing wetland vegetation to regenerate. DPOR monitor water depth, salinity and pH levels of selected wetlands at regular intervals. This monitoring is essential to keep track of impacts on water quality. The south coast is an extremely important area for a wide range of shorebirds, usually found on sandy beaches and near intertidal habitats or inland wetlands. They feed by wading in shallow waters and probing wet mud or sand with their bills. While many shorebirds are residents here all year round, some migrate annually from the other side of the globe, from as far away as Siberia, stopping over at vulnerable locations along the way, such as the Yellow Sea in China, where wetlands are under pressure from development. They spend the summer feeding in places, including the wetlands of the south coast of WA, to build up energy reserves for their long journey home. BirdLife Australia conducts annual shorebird counts with the help of volunteers and bird groups across Australia to monitor numbers and potential threats to the bird's future. As part of the Community Conservation Project, Shorebirds 2020, Dr Golo Mora runs workshops to assist volunteers in their identification skills. Well, shorebird migration is one of the most amazing feats in the animal kingdom. It takes little birds that weigh as little as 30 grams all the way from their Arctic breeding grounds, which can be as far away as Siberia or Alaska, 10 to 12,000 kilometer journey down here in a matter of, of, of weeks or only a couple of months, and have lost a lot of, of their fat reserves by the time they get here. So they normally get straight into feeding and rebuilding that body fat, and they can put on up to 75% of their, of their body weight in the time, about six months that they spend here. So. That's really a sign of how incredibly productive and rich these Ramsar wetlands are.
Even when wetlands are healthy and intact, there are a number of threats to the survival of shorebirds, such as increased disturbance by people, dogs and vehicles, which make many areas unsuitable for them. The shorebird species that I think are most vulnerable around this area are uh, amongst the resident shorebirds, probably the, the hooded plovers. And amongst the migratory shorebirds, we've got a, a wide range of species that actually rely on this area. So uh, commonly you'd see sharp-tailed sandpipers or red-necked stints, which really rely on this area as a terminal stop on their long migration from the Arctic. So they really need to find a rich food source because they have to travel another 10 or 12,000 kilometers back in only a half a year's time. Over 1,300 bird watchers nationwide volunteer their time to count shorebirds and take part in the citizen science, which provides important information about these intrepid little birds. There's a lot of things we can do just by being aware and looking out for them. There's a very sort of individual responsibility to help those shorebirds make the journey back. For the same reason we have well-managed and protected areas on land, there's a growing understanding that the ocean, which supports a unique and diverse range of species and sensitive marine habitats, needs to be well-managed and protected too. State marine waters extend from the coastline out three nautical miles, including three nautical miles offshore of islands. Beyond this, is Commonwealth waters. The glistening Southern Ocean wraps around headlands and islands, a luminous and inviting turquoise tint. For many, life revolves around the ocean. It's home to a diverse range of ocean-going animals adapted to suit the cold temperatures and high-impact coastline. Southern right whales rely on stop-off points in their migratory path, dotted all along the south coast. These oceanic giants annually pull in to specific areas to breed, carve and rest, providing an opportunity for people to watch in awe as they teach their newborn calves the way of life. The temperate marine environments of the south coast are known for their high biodiversity. Endemism is also high, particularly amongst the invertebrates such as sponges, with 156 sponge species recorded in these waters. A major ocean current, the Lewin Current, originates in the tropics and makes its way down the West Australian coast, wrapping around Cape Lewin and heading east as far as Tasmania in some years. It brings warm, nutrient-poor waters to the south coast and has a substantial influence on the region's marine species and climate. The south coast is also directly influenced by cold southern ocean currents and this mixture of waters results in unique assemblages of tropical, subtropical but predominantly temperate marine species. Offshore islands such as the magnificent Recherche Archipelago provide important habitat, breeding and resting sites for many species of seabirds and two species of marine mammals, which are kept in check by the top of the food chain. In comparison with similar marine environments around the world, the waters here are not highly productive. A small commercial fishing fleet rely on the bounty beneath the surface to make a living. The largest commercial fisheries of the south coast are the abalone fishery, 
demersal gill net fishery for sharks and the Perth Seine pilchard fishery. Commercial fishers are implementing smarter fishing practices. With support from Ocean Watch Australia, CNET and the West Australian Fishing Industry Council. Jay Shoesmith from CNET helps fishermen integrate these sustainable practices into their fishery. My particular role is I'm the CNET Extension Officer for West Australia.